Welcome to season three of Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Littman, your host. I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. We have another wonderfully rich program today, thanks to the Gail R. Reardon Climate in the Arts Legacy Fund. Gail was an incredibly gifted professional cellist and beloved music teacher who passed far too soon. Her legacy lives on through arts and advocacy and through this series, which continues every second Wednesday from 11 a.m. to noon until May 19th. Today, I will be introducing three amazing artists who, through their expressive talents, have been shifting cultural narratives and inspiring new ways of seeing that are central, not peripheral, to social change. I first photographed Roy Henry Vickers more than 25 years ago for a magazine cover followed by a book cover and a variety of other family photos. Roy was born in Northern British Columbia in Canada. He is an internationally renowned artist who's known for his distinctive style of painting, sculpture and carvings, and is a respected artistic advisor on projects that have included Expo 86 and the Vancouver International Airport. His Tofino BC gallery is a truly unique and wonderful experience visited internationally by many. Roy remains actively involved in numerous creative endeavors, including the illustration and publication of many best-selling books and prints. Roy Henry Vickers is the recipient of both the Order of British Columbia and the Order of Canada, and he is a highly respected Indigenous knowledge keeper. Welcome, Roy. Thank you so much for joining us from Hazleton, BC, where your Instagram account is filled with so many images of the gorgeous river that's right outside on your deck. So how is it there today? It is absolutely gorgeous, kind of cold. It's, uh, it was minus 28.5 when I woke up this morning. And when you look outside, uh, I'm coming to you from the land of the Gixian people. And the people here called this river that I live on Xien, which literally means uh, cloud waters. And this morning when I look at the river, it looks like steam coming off. So I know that it's very, very cold out there. I'm proud to be coming here from, from the land of the Kixian people. Um, I'm actually a member of the House of Gale from Kispiox, my brother Walter Harris. One of my mentors and an incredible artist adopted me a number of years ago. So I'm mm -hmm. part of the village of Kispiox. Well, we're proud to have you. And your family history connects you to the land in a way that has really shaped your perception and the way you share your art and stories. Can you please tell us more about how your ancestors trained your eye and your senses? I sure can. I come from the village of Kitkatla which is over 5,000 years old, as I'm told by archeologists. And growing up in that village, there was no electricity, no running water. Uh, you hunt and you fish and uh, cut wood to keep warm. So I grew up with my uncle Henry Vickers, who taught me to look at the land with the eyes of a trapper and a hunter and someone who was uh, intimately involved with the environment. So at a young age, I became in, intimately involved with the land and I still am. And I, I know that when you say intimate, like it really involves all your senses. I, I recall a conversation with you where you could smell snow or rain or, and, and I, I, can you just share a little more of that? I just found it so fascinating because that's really, you, you feel that when I, I when you look at your your work that you can almost smell it and feel it and taste it and touch it. It's so real. Um, yes. In the language of my ancestors from the coast here, uh, the words are all about the land, the moon, the winds, the tides, and how the moon affects the tides. And many times with my grandpa out on the ocean, he'd ask me, well, what do you see there, Roy? And I'd look around and say, oh, I see 
sky and the trees and the ocean and he'd do this <laughs> and he'd look around he say, take another look and tell me what do you see there so I'd look really hard and think what does he mean oh well there's a west wind blowing I can see the clouds moving from the west and the tide's going out oh and there's some nice logs on the beach over there and he'd smile a big smile and he'd say yeah, that's what I mean. You have to look. And that's what I think all too many of us forget to do is really take that, that sharpening of our vision and hone in on the finest of details. Like we, we, we see with our eyes, but instead of all our senses. And that's what I'm hearing from you. So do you have to believe that artists can help change the social narrative? Oh, absolutely. That's been the... The response to whom much is given, much is required is what my mother taught me. And artists through the ages have always reflected on the environment, uh, on the people, and made their comments to the people about what they see and what they feel. And I'm no different. I, I grew up with a very traditional art form and then broke out and became uh, an expression of all of my ancestors, which are European as well as the West Coast. And in doing so, I realized that we have a treasure here in British Columbia and we share it with the world and help teach people that beautiful, pristine rivers like the Skeena that flows by in front of me are, are a gift and we should take care of them. Mm -hmm. Boy, if we could only get more people to listen to that wisdom, we wouldn't be in the problems that we, you know, have the issues we have now. In one of your discussions, you talked about the disconnect to the land through commodification. And I love how you shared that. You talked of way back, like to like the, the nets. Do you want to just uh, try to refresh your memory on that conversation? Yes. Growing up in the village when I was a young boy, we didn't have access to the world outside because we had no electricity, uh, so no televisions, no radios. So all of our interaction was with other people in the village. And as I grew and learned who I was from discrimination that, was, that came my way because of the color of my skin, I began to look at the, my heritage. And then I came to the realization that since colonialism, our people have been forced to try and live a different way. And in, in that disconnect from the land, we've become disconnected from each other. And as people walking on the earth, we are walking on the dust and bones of our ancestors. And our ancestors run through our, our blood. Their, their DNA is physically part of us. Every ancestor that walked before. So if we can understand this, then we walk on the land in a different way. And instead of being people like I was as a young man, walking on the land of my ancestors, but disconnected from it, uh, I came to a place where I needed healing and that healing involved my relationship to myself and an understanding that I'm connected to my ancestors and my ancestors are the land. So it opened up this incredible expression of myself as an artist and my love of the land and my desire to urge people to connect to this beautiful land we call British Columbia. It's certainly a, a special home to many. And, you know, we're very fortunate we have so many trees. And I know there's a special relationship to all nature in, you know, First Nations knowledge. But with trees, can you speak to that a little bit? Like how, how you perceive trees? Trees, well, our, our words for trees uh, are, are speaking of them as people, as living beings. And one of the incredible things that struck me one day was uh, learning from David Suzuki that in the tree itself 
is the DNA of salmon in the tree. <laughs> so wrapping my brain around that, I realized, okay, the salmon come up the river and they feed us, we're the salmon people, and they feed all of the birds and all of the animals. And many of the animals carry the carcasses of the salmon up into the woods to eat them. And the bones and whatever's left of the salmon go into the ground and they feed the trees. And so the trees feed us, they give us oxygen. Mm -hmm. Our word for eagle, skeek, the big fir tree is geek. And so I thought, well, maybe the word means the one that sits in the big fir tree. And then my grandmother said, well, skeek, skeek. Went, oh, maybe it's the word. So it's, it's all about our connection to the land. And those trees that grow on this river, the big cottonwoods, they soak up the moisture from the river in huge abundance. There's even sand in the, I call them the arteries of the cottonwood. So when you're cutting a cottonwood to, for firewood, your chain on your chainsaw gets dull because there's sand in the wood. So the trees are these incredible living beings. And in the end, we learn that they provide us with oxygen, which we need to breathe. Do we ever? Wow. Well, thank you. And, and do you want to just uh, tell us what you're working on now, these days? Oh, my goodness. Where do I start there? <laughs> <laughs> I've just finished a, a book with Lucky Bud and Harbor Publishing, uh, the first West Coast alphabet. So that's just done. I'm working on another book called The Story of Ben, who's a pet sea lion. I'm working on a new Valentine piece right now, I'm aided by a good yogi friend of mine, Samantha Dubinsky. I'm working on a new surf piece in Tofino on the West Coast, so on and on it goes. I never stop. I don't think so. You're prolific. And if there's any sort of last words of advice that you'd like to share, I, I mean, we could just talk on and on and we will be taking questions later. Roy, is there, is there some, a word of advice or some final knowledge you'd like to share before we, we move on to uh, Roberta? Yes, we are all one. There's only one race of human beings. Their racism is an ignorant term. It, it tells us that there are different races. And if we're all one race, well, how can, how can there be racism? And science has finally caught up to this ancient knowledge of our people by finding that if we all trace our matrilineal lineage through our DNA, we will find that we all come to one gene, mm -hmm. uh, the mit mitochondrial gene, I think it's called, uh, otherwise known as the Eve gene. So we are all one, let's live as one and be as one. Brilliant. Beautifully said. Thank you, my friend. That's so nice to see you. I just your your vast knowledge, your wisdom. Um, we just need more of these sessions with you. So thank you so much. We'll come back. And uh, like I say, take some questions later. And thank you so much. Thank you. Roberta Pick Sutherland is a contemporary Canadian artist who works from both Victoria and her fabulous Hornby Island studio, two scenic ferry rides away from Vancouver Island. From her first solo show at the Van or Victoria Art Gallery in the 1980s, Pick's work has continued to focus on the environment and the interconnectivity of all life forms. Her body of work is extensive and is featured and collected internationally. Hey, Pix, welcome. Oh, oh okay. nice to see you. I just love visiting your Hornby Island studio and garden. You are certainly prolific. So what are, you, what are you working on these days? Maybe it's your turn to tell us. Like, and, and how are you enlivening people's awareness of the, of the environment and interconnectivity? Well, first, I'd just like to say um, to, thanks to Roy for that introduction. And I just couldn't uh, feel so honored to be, um, to be on sharing all this with you because it's just so um, 
it's just so timely and it's such a gift. And uh, especially when Roy's talking about the interconnectivity and, and the work I want to show today is about mushrooms and uh, which I've kind of fallen down, a, a stumbled into wonder in the forest. And um, the way the forest is fed by the, and the trees are fed by the mushrooms and the small details. And that's what I'm going to go into in the work. It's all about the details, the beauties in the details. It's, um, and uh, like Roy said, they, I mean, this network, the, the mushrooms feed the forest, the forest feed us. I mean, it just, uh, the links and the, our connections, once we open our eyes to them, are just permeating everything. And it's so, so exciting, isn't it? Yeah, and you're gonna share some images with us. And uh, yeah, and I just wanted to let people know that um, Creatively United is actually, you, well, you're doing that, Roberta, I'll just chatter away here, that Creatively United is actually working on a piece right now that shows that interconnectivity with the mushrooms, the forest, and the trees. And uh, this is going to be a project that involves members of the Victoria Symphony and Ballet Victoria and uh, a number of other artists. So do uh, stay tuned. We have something coming up this spring, uh, summer. Pix, what are we seeing? It looks like your studio what, or uh, your work. Yes, it's in the full studio. forage here. Um, you'll be able to see some of these pieces uh, as I go through them and the, get the, uh, it's, it gets a little bit of creative chaos and here we, I'm finding mushrooms and I'm doing this basic uh, spore print that a lot of uh, sort of first step in identifying a species. And I'm quite astounded as I um, was just amazed at the var variation, at the shapes, they're just like wow, so rich. And I started gathering them, placing them. And when I was, seeing these are large pieces they're just sort of almost three feet by four feet and the variation and when they're grouped like this they're called gregarious when they grow in groups and I love that because they're they're so um, so I guess um, oriented to be together like all of us are and I'm looking at um, such a uh, scope and I so I decided I'll lay them out and see what I really have here and then I'm seeing you can see this too the, the tremendous variety this is one kind of mushroom that's just been laid out and these are the the way they print and here's an example of 35 mushrooms that are, that are looking so similar I put walnut ink down because I'm realize they're going to print with a white uh, spore and look how varied they are and the remarkable differences and this is what has kept me down this rabbit hole <laughs> of investigating how they can be almost like a breath the spore falls through the air and these almost ghost-like images and quite unique up here. This one, here's an example. I thought they were going to print in white. And the dark ground was ready for them and they printed dark. And it's a learning curve, but I found this had its own mystery. And these, you'll be surprised to know, I bought these shiitake mushrooms at the market. And here they are, just away from their their woods and yet they're still re with life and still dropping their spore in quite a magical way. And the variety, as I'm saying is to do, I'm trying to, as I'm learning, it's about timing. And these, I can sometimes get a second print of the younger mushroom. So the younger, middle-aged, they like to spread their spore. The older ones, well, not so much. A bit like us, and uh, <laughs> here they are. This is uh, a second printing almost from that first group on the periphery. I know when I walked into your studio, I was, I just wasn't sure what I was seeing. I'm seeing all these mushrooms 
on pieces of, of this art paper and I'm thinking, boy, Pix really likes eating mushrooms. <laughs> I didn't realize you were making these amazing prints just by simply having the mushrooms sit on the paper. Right. Like they're doing their own, they're making their own art right in front of your eyes, basically. They are doing it and I'm I'm astounded what they're doing. And I start grouping them into this into the round shape, the circle. And so here's just one. It's almost like they're snowflakes almost. There's each one unique and and beautiful. And and so much detail. See. Yeah, so fine all that detail. That's what amazes me. Isn't we it? put a mushroom head and we don't see the underside because we're not looking. We're not trained to necessarily look at the underside. We just see a mushroom, right? And when you even when you look at the gill when you turn it over, you don't realize the intricacy. And it's just like Roy was saying, the details. There's such beauty in the details here. And I've gathered these and in the next slide you'll see that how these small, you know, just minuscule differences. Look at this. This is one of the ones I thought was the most beautiful. And so I had it magnified and printed. And That's incredible pics, love that. Like it's almost coming off the page. Look at that, it's so beautiful. And, and obviously the mushroom's not that big. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but in this shot, I, I mean, anyone in another country might think we grow big mushrooms like we grow big trees. <laughs> I've actually been asked that Did you, when I've exhibited them. Somebody's asked me, oh, my God, you had a mushroom that big. You know? But I have seen pictures of such. And, but these are tiny. And you can see that um, this was a, a forage, an afternoon. And I take a, one of my canvases to use as a tray and a sharp pair of scissors so that I'm not disturbing what are the roots or the mycelium. So I just cut off the, the, uh, the fruit, which is the gill, and um, bring them home. So this is one uh, forest walk. And I laying them out when I come back. And I'm, again, just enjoying each individual contribution there on the page. Yeah, it's incredible. It's like you have a, a family of mushrooms in your studio, like many families. You've got lots of friends. Yes. And um, they can be quite, uh, they quite have, can have quite an odor <laughs> when you have a lot of them in the studio. And when I'm gathering, and you know how when you're looking at a mushroom closely and you're seeing, there it is, you sweat with its chickweed and fine grasses around it. And I brought some of those into the studio and used them as a stencil here. Mm, beautiful. And I've also combined some earth pigment. And this is some green earth with these. Mm. And again, as they say, there's... I'm, I feel like I'm collaborating as I don't quite know what they're going to do next, except offer something beautiful. Very nice. Wow. And I added some fiber here. I was trying to evoke the, the uh, mycelium, the fine roots. And this is an iron oxide with ochre and the white spores and the dark spores in this one. Incredible. You and I used it in my work with handmade paper and um, my previous series was all about dots and I used the, mus the mushrooms as the circles in this piece. So just ways that, as I say, I can be sort of playing with them and earth colors, earth pigments and making these large drawings and they can have a floating quality and then I'm looking at color. I thought, well, okay, different backgrounds of color. And I'm also noticing here these flaring. And this is to do with the amount of uh, uh, turbulence in the air. So if I have a window open and I've learned whether I, if I want them to, to have a cross draft and then we'll start making these um, the sort of breathing onto the page the way they do. And Sometimes like this is a large figure um, that looks almost like a spore spirit that's arrived. And uh, you can see why it's like pretty captivating. The beauty's in the details. Even the tiniest one with this, uh, some little insect drawing a small design here. Hmm. And now I'm 
being more aware of the different colors and how it can combine the spore prints or those spores are different colors and they print differently. And you can see that in this piece and layer them. And how do you preserve these picks? And so, well, I'm working on different kinds of sprays, but that's why some of them I've printed as, as photographs, because I'm just not sure how long or what will, you know, and nobody could tell me. I contacted the Smithsonian even to find out how to conserve them. And there is a European spray that's quite helpful. And um, printing them seems to be the safest. Mm. And that's what I've done. Absolutely gorgeous. And I know this is just one part of your vast collection of work. Like this yes. is on theme because the, the possibilities are infinite and endless when it comes to being an artist and, and uh, having a creative mind. And I, that's why, you know, we're creatively united for the planet because it's going to take creative solutions to, you know, answer the needs that we have to get to the solutions we we, we, we have all already determined, but need to bring forward and, and new solutions all the time as we build on other solutions, much like your print series, right? That's totally true also of the, of the mushrooms, you know, that we're just, we've only discovered this like an iceberg, a tiny fraction of the species that are available and mushrooms are our closest cellular relatives. So, which is an amazing, and they're a kingdom. And we see that's the word they use, the botanical word, the kingdom of mushrooms. And you can just see the magic that's here. I mean, so that has lots of layers of meaning too. Absolutely. And, and I think that's where people sort of lose sight. They see the, they see the forest, not the trees and what goes, what's connected to, with that. So when we lose a tree, we're losing the ecosystem potentially that goes with it, the mycelium network, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a lot at stake. <laughs> but right. yes, mushrooms are exciting. Holy moly. And we've only started to tap into their, their potential to, you know, earth remediation, that they can actually um, heal the earth. Like something I, I can imagine bringing mushrooms to the tar sands and, and someday that we could reclaim all of that. It will happen, but it's oh, going to yes. But that's, the, that's what they can do. They can even, you know, we can even be buried with spores in a shroud and they'll even create something beautiful out of us as we leave. That sounds like a brilliant idea. That's very beautiful. In fact, I just remember seeing something uh, recently that I think Washington State is the only state that has this happening where they're doing a, they're doing a earth, um, putting, putting people into the earth now, but in a, in a, in, um, it's not into the ground per se, but they're creating soil from people. So they're really they're using the rot concept to for recycling soil and then putting that soil into forests, which I like, again, the mushrooms can then come to that. Mushrooms so, are very involved with that. So, you know, we could remediate all these oil tanks and where, where there's been, you know, gas stations and things like that, that mushrooms can do all that very effectively. That's a whole other subject, so. <laughs> well, it's a very exciting one. And see, that's why we need the artists and the scientists. I think it's it's like, that's why this is a Climate in the Arts series. <laughs> so thank you, Pix. This is wonderful. I'm, I'm looking forward to us sharing something really exciting together near the end of our program. So everybody stay tuned. We're, we're coming back. Thank you so much, Pix. David Ellingson is a Vancouver Island-based photographer whose images speak to the relationship between humans and the natural world. David's work is intensely focused on documenting the ways biodiversity loss and deforestation are affecting our environment. His photographs are exhibited, collected, awarded, and featured internationally. As a freelance assignment photographer, David has worked with some major clients like the New York Times Magazine, the Oprah Winfrey Network, People Magazine, and CBC Radio Canada, to name just a few. I had the great honor of interviewing David for a show on Artists as Changemakers that we produce for television that you can actually find on Creatively United's YouTube channel and from which we just showed you a few images and clips from. Nice to see you again, David. I see you're, there you are. And oh, well, you guess. are one busy guy. We we're so <laughs> lucky to have you with us today as I understand this is not your first webinar or interview of the day. Nope. So tell us. 
Yeah. What your work has always been so evocative and incredibly eye-catching. Can you can you share with us more about your work and how it relates to the environmental um, movement, social justice, and and generally awareness? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I started my career in photography when I was thirty, <clears throat> and I've been in doing it for twenty years. The first ten was a commercial as a commercial photographer. And um, do you want me to share my screen as well now, or should I wait for a bit? Oh, totally up to you. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and do that then. Better to see that than anything. And um, after about 10 years of working in the commercial world, which uh, Francis just mentioned a couple of the, the places that I work there, um, I, I moved into the into the art world. And uh, I was born and raised on Cortez Island, so about 150 miles north of Victoria, where I'm sitting right now. Um, and my family were the very first uh, settlers on Cortez in 1887, and we've had a presence there ever since. So I grew up in, um, much like it sounds like with Roy, um, I grew up on the land. We had, uh, my family had a farm there. We lived on the ocean and I, I was literally raised, uh, you know, in the forest and on the edge of the ocean. And uh, that, um, that uh, has had a real effect on me over my life. And I realized as I was uh, moving into the art world that that's exactly what I wanted to speak to was the, 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 the preciousness of, of all life and, um, and uh, bring uh, awareness to the environmental and climate crisis. Well, you so, heard climate series, right? I, I know when when um, I did this interview with you a few years ago, you were amassing images for this whole, this is it here, I suppose. You yes, yeah. yeah. So this is weather patterns. And this actually um, uh, uh, has been, uh, it's a long term project. Um, I photograph one photograph every day at the same place. And it's been, I mean, I'm in year 10 at this point. So what we're looking at right now is all the days that I photographed in 2020. And so the, what this project is, it was, uh, it was inspired by, uh, you know, about probably 11 years ago, I, I was reading all of these um, um, uh, climate records that were cons con consistently being broken. There was always these new records being set in terms of, of rising temperatures. And uh, I quickly realized as I was reading a new one that I forgot what, was happen what had happened la the week before. And I thought this is such a momentous time in, uh, in, um, in, in climate and environment. And I wanted to sort of memorialize or remember these events for myself. And so that was the genesis for this project was making these essentially these documents of memory. And so this particular one here, so here's all the photographs of 2020. And so I, I take each, a photograph each day, I put that aside. And, um, and then I just wait. And if, if I um, become aware of a new climate record that has happened, I go back and retrieve all of the days to do with that. So sure enough, 2020 tied with 2016 for being the hottest year on record in recorded history. And so I returned to my archives, retrieved all of the days to do with 2020 and um, put them together into this large uh, uh, sort of um, uh, compilation or composite. And the title becomes 2020 tied with 2016 for the hottest year in recorded history. And we get other interesting things too. You can see sort of about the, a third the way down on the right hand side here um, is this sort of yellow uh, tone to the, to the photograph. So you can start to see evidence of the forest fires as we are impacted by the smoke here from those fires on the West Coast. So there's, there's, there are other elements creeping into these photographs that I hadn't anticipated at the beginning. Um, so this is really uh, sort of, a, again, a way to sort of memorialize and document the, um, the, 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 the changing climate as it, as it goes. Here's all the photographs I made over the last decade from 2000. I started the project in 2011, all the way through the last day of 2019. And these, I arranged these to uh, refer to the rise in carbon dioxide over that decade as well. Fascinating. Yeah, and here was uh, two, 2019 on March the 20th, which was the first day of spring. Uh, we broke um, 48 temperature records on the first day of spring here in British Columbia. And so for me, when I read that kind of thing, it's, it stirs me to record that and make, make a, a, a work about that particular uh, event. So, um, so that's really what is coming uh, for, for, you know, for this project. And now at this time in the, in the, in the, um, the project, it's sort of really sort of hitting its stride. And I just had its first show down in uh, the San Jose uh, Institute of Contemporary Art. So that was good. It was a projected exhibition. Um, so these digital projections that would go on as, as a slideshow in the gallery space there. So, so you get a good idea of that. So that's been very, uh, very um, satisfying. Um, 
and I move into other th things, you know, other points of interest, such as the plastics uh, pollution crisis that we're having. So this is a series of these um, uh, items that I found, find typically at the shore, but some, some other places as well. And I make these photographs. Um, uh, I retrieve, you know, this is a fishing buoy that I found it on the shoreline. I drag it down to the water and make these long exposure photographs. So everything becomes soft and muted, almost as a reflection of the um, disintegration of these items into the environment. So looking at that and, uh, and one of the things I discovered on this project was uh, sort of shockingly, um, studies are only now beginning on the long-term effects of these microplastics in our environment, which of course they found those now from, you know, the, the highest peaks on the, on, the, on the planet to the deepest ocean trenches, there's evidence of plastic pollution. So uh, we're only gonna be finding out later um, what is um, what are the long-term effects of these on our health. Of course, we can probably guess that they're probably not gonna be positive, but um, we'll wait for the science to speak on that one. Wow. And how has how has COVID? Just curious, affected any of these shows or any of your showings? Uh, the work that you're doing has has it has it actually amplified things for you, or is it? Um, well, I think uh, I, I, in terms of exhibition, no, it has not. Like the one, for instance, the one at San Jose that was we had that booked for um, for uh, um, a few months down there, and really, I I, I think it was only about four, maybe five weeks, uh, it was able, able to open. And then of course it was restricted entry and all of that. So like pretty much every artist around the world, there, was, there were many frustrations um, in terms of exhibiting over the last, uh, the last year. But, um, but uh, you know, we, like everybody, we've all turned to the online world, um, which uh, you know, has incredible potential and reach there for getting uh, messages across. So, um, so that's been good. And you, know, you just have to, like, like everybody, we just had to roll with the situation and make the best of it. So, so, so are these, are these are, are, like, I guess the question is, other than your website, are these, are these being exhibited online? Like I know with all these interviews and webinars that you're doing, how mm -hmm. are people able to, to see these um, in a- Yeah, well, for instance, again, like I'll use the, 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 the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art. So th this exhibition is archived on their, on their um, uh, exhibition, uh, uh, on their website, on their ex exhibition history. And so people can go and visit it there. Um, it goes out through all of my social media. Um, and um, I have sort of various channels, uh, various uh, partners that, um, that also I, I show the work through and disseminate it. But um, mostly I'm focused on exhibition, which admittedly has been tightened up over the last year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, carry on please, yes. For sure. So, and my most, I would say my, the, the series that has, has probably resonated with people most strongly over the course of the last 10 years has been this project here, The Last Stand, um, which um, is focused on, as you can see, every, every British Columbian is very well acquainted with these scenes, um, uh, the um, scenes of the forest um, in the, um, um, these scenes of the, of the forest, um, and specifically the stumps that are left behind by that first round of logging um, uh, in, the, uh, in the old growth forest there. And uh, these uh, photographs were taken um, on Cortez, on the, the family farm there. And I discovered through the process of shooting this that it was actually my great uncle and great grandfather who cut these trees down. Um, we have, uh, we, I mentioned my, the sort of uh, um, uh, uh, um, history that we have on Cortez. Um, and uh, we've been, my family's been involved in the logging industry since that time. So I come from a, from a quite a, uh, an interesting um, uh, perspective in terms of logging and, uh, and, um, and th this is uh, sort of a, a reflection of that. So there's some of the, um, uh, the old tools that were used and uh, went back and, and sort of reinstalled those into, into the forest scenes. And, um, and this has gone I think because of that sort of family connection that I have with this work and the, the sort of the, the interest in that department there, that that's one of the reasons that this has probably resonated quite, quite well. And also um, what's happening in the forests in the Pacific Northwest here in British Columbia are you know, the deforestation that's happening. And, we're, and as we're coming to grips with the fact of how important the forests are, Roy, Roy mentioned that earlier too about you know, the, the most basic fact of the oxygen that we breathe come from these and, the, and how this is uh, 
the deforestation issues are reflected all around the world. We think of the Amazon and uh, the forests of the Central African continent and Indonesia and all of that. And that, that it's, all, it's happening in all of the great primary forests of the world that are left, which of course are becoming uh, um, um, more and more um, um, uh, harvested, I guess you want to say. Or, so uh, yeah, so lots of work. I work on a sort of a, definitely a project basis and, um, and I, I really span a wide range of medium, um, of media it, within photography itself, film and digital and all kinds of different techniques. Um, uh, and, uh, but all of them are united through this, uh, this interest in um, the human relationship with the natural world. And wow. so that's really uh, the, the link between all of my work. Wow, David, you're, what a diverse portfolio. It's just amazing. So it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So I encourage you all to go back uh, into Creatively United's uh, YouTube channel and, and take a look at our artists as change makers that we did a few years ago. Thank you so much for your time, David. Right. Very much appreciated. So before we move into questions with Valentine's Day, just around the corner, we have come up with a creative way to share some love for our forests. And you are the first to know about this. So we have a show your love for the forest mountain road uh, campaign and this image was created as a gift to me by my artist friend Nelson Dewey, a professional cartoonist and storyboard artist who knows that I have a serious love for trees. So this was a personal piece of art he created that we have repurposed for this Show Your Love campaign. And as many of you know, Creatively United produced a feature video with award-winning recording artist and author, Ian Mortifee and her friends called Awaken. And I just wanna show you a quick 45 second clip from it as it features the forest that um, we, I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about. For the love of our home, we are taking a stand. We are a tribe, we are a tribe, awakening, listening to the heartbeat of a new birth. Earth is you, Earth is me. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. We're listening to the rhythm of a heartbeat. So this video um, was inspired and filmed in the beautiful 49 acre forest that the Habitat Acquisition Trust needs $1 million to ensure that this ecosystem and wildlife corridor in the heart of Saanich remains as a park and doesn't become a development site. And HAT has until Earth Day, April 22nd, to come up with the funding. And the artists you have heard today are all generously giving of their talent to help out. This month, we are featuring an incredible package that features a three-night stay for four people in a fabulous home that you can see on the left there with a picture-perfect ocean view from every window of this beautiful Tribune Bay ideally situated um, home. It has a large deck and access to one of the best beaches on the island. There'll be a studio tour and a piece of original art by our award-winning Hornby Island artist, Roberta Pick Sutherland, a symbolic deed for the forest you have saved, plus memories to last a lifetime. The value of this is priceless. Picks, are you there to tell us quickly what you are donating? Well, as I mentioned, I thought this was one of the most um, striking of these uh, of the prints of the showing the intricate detail of well, not just it just really symbolizes for me the the incredible detail. No matter how you can go as close as an electron microscope, or if you, well, however, and David's photography, just so that we we can. Um, really remind ourselves to really look like Roy was talking about earlier, just opening ourselves to this incredible world around us. And I just thought that this piece is, is because it was such a tiny, tiny little mushroom and just, just how, as I say, like an exquisite snowflake or just the unique, the way we are as individuals.
<laughs> you know? Beautiful. Well, thank you, Pix, and to our Hornby Island Getaway donors for their generosity. And if someone wants to make a major donation today, this could be your Valentine gift solution. So please visit mountainroadforest.ca or even creativelyunited.org for more information how this could be yours to enjoy. And now for some questions. Hallelujah. All right. This one is from a Rob, and he is asking on the theme of interconnectedness. Pix mentioned that the mushrooms nurtured the trees around them in the forest. Please elaborate. Have you depicted mushrooms with trees? Well, it's the mycelium, this fine, almost like hair-like network that passes the nutrients from this, that they gather from the soil into the trees. And like uh, Roy was saying, those nutrients come from whether it's the animals or whatever they, all the, they would you say the compost of the forest, the soil, and they bring that and and then offer that in these fine, this, these networks they gather from, there's some as large as all the way down to Oregon. Some of the, almost like the biggest plants in the world are these small, hum, humble little things that we see on the surface. The mycelium network, yes, it's considered the internet of the trees. So that's right. Yes. And um, I'm just, this is a comment more than a question. Um, Sandy has said, Roy Henry Vickers said, my ancestors are the land. As a settler, my ancestors are from Europe, but I feel so connected to the land of the Kwatsin people. I have learned so much through the phrase, all my relations. So thank you, Sandy, for sharing that. And another question here, this is from another artist, um, Jillian Redwood. Thank you to all the participating artists, rich and affirming presentations. I have a question for Pix. How do you introduce color to your work and do you use photographic printing or another print technique? I'm using color with just the raw earth pigments. And, and I'm actually, bl I blend that just using a small chamois. And, uh, and I kind of made my own brushes out of that. And I use the, uh, the raw pigments. And... Wonderful, thank you. We don't have a ton of questions, I'm very surprised. So I'm going to um, just let, um, let you all know that we have a ton of information on creativelyunited.org. So you'll find out more about these kind of things there. And um, I would also like to thank Arashe Barker for her artwork for today's banner. This is uh, Arashe's art that you saw in today's banner and Arashe in action at some of our Creatively United Earth Day festivals. While she was still a high school student, Arashe created and showcased her own designs while making a statement about waste and ways to recycle. Thanks Arashe, if you're watching, she's in Australia right now and due to the time zone, uh, she could not join us today, but we just wanted to pay homage to her. So um, thank you again to our artists. And uh, I just, before we finish, we've got a couple more things to share with you. Um, I'd like for you all to join us again on Wednesday, February 24th, where we will delve into reimagining agriculture from regenerative farming to local food security and how we can adapt to the new climate reality. Before we go, I see some more questions have come in. Excellent. Now you guys are all jumping on it. Okay, let's see if I can ask a few questions. Oh, someone really wants to see more of Roy's paintings. So Roy, uh, you have a, your website, what do you suggest? Uh, I would suggest going to my website. They're, they're all there. Um, I live away up in northern BC, far from the gallery, but I, I, I don't have any paintings to show you here. I'm sorry, but you can find them at RoyHenryVickers.com. Right. And Roy, we had talked about potentially sharing more of your work. I did in, in the intro, but Roy, you are from a tradition of storytellers and, and the, vis the verbal. So you, you're not someone who necessarily wants to have a presentation that shows a lot of work, correct? Yes. I, uh, I've done a lot of speaking in, in keynote addresses and I've always shied away from uh, my early experiences of using a, a, a screen behind me. Uh, when you're sharing stories, it's important for people to listen, and sometimes images can distract us. So um, I've, I've learned to use my voice uh, in a way that I never, ever thought I could do. I, I've always been shy, 
but it was brought to me one day that I was given the gift of storytelling and I've had many storytellers who've given me stories. And one of the most important teachers I've had uh, told me this and it applies to each one of us. Um, the stories are the most important story part of our expression as human beings. And the most important story that you have to share with the world is yours. Beautiful. There's only one you, the rest are taken, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's beautiful. Another question has come in to all of you. Um, have you, have the artists seen change over time? I'm not sure oh. change in context to exactly what, but change. Roy, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Um, you know, the changes in my coming up to 75 years of life have been living with nature, uh, eating from nature, keeping warm from nature, um, no televisions, no electricity, storytellers all around, musicians all around. And today, look at what we're doing. We're all in separate places in the country and we're, and we're sharing ourselves and our stories with people and we don't even know who they all are. It's absolute, absolute massive change. And um, one thing that never changes is the pricelessness of this world that we live in. And I hope the biggest change that this pandemic has brought is for us to come back to the realization that there's something more important than uh, a false world economy. And that is a pricelessness of our relationship to the world around us. And I, I, it's, it's an honor for me to share this space with you all, uh, Pix and David, uh, Francis, thank you for bringing me here. And I, I hope that we can make a difference. Oh, I know you're making a difference. And uh, we're getting lots of chat comments that, you know, thank you for sharing. And Karen, Francis, maybe you could say more about the forest. About the mountain road forest? Well, picks. It's uh, this, this forest touched me so deeply. Um, I have a friend who lives on the edge of that forest and, and uh, she just said to me, we, you know, this is a, such a precious area. She's seen bear, she's seen deer, she's seen birds of every description. She's seen so much life in that forest. And uh, that's what's really inspired me to even do Creatively United was just the trees outside of my own window, seeing the amount of life in the trees just outside my own window. And then seeing that there was arbutus groves and fir groves and all these precious, amazing ecosystems intact within this forest. And although they're second growth, it didn't, it doesn't matter. They're just so beautiful, including a, a freshwater stream running through it. So my heart just, uh, you know, is so expanded when it comes to trying to be an advocate for those that don't have a voice. And as artists, um, I think, I think, well, personally, I, I, I know for myself, that I'm just so touched to my core because of that level of seeing that goes beyond the obvious, which was today's program. And as you illustrated, Roberta, you know, and Roy illustrated and David, um, I just, you, you can't sit back any longer when something moves your soul so deeply. And trees and ecosystems are, are, are all part and parcel of that, as Roy said. And um, I heard from another fabulous artist, Ian McAllister, who we've had on our program before of the great, um, lives up in the Great Bear Rainforest uh, of Pacific Wild. And, you know, the first time I heard him speak, oh, it was probably 15 years ago, and I found out about how the salmon feed the forest and the forest feed the, feed the bear and, on, and the salmon and the interrelatedness of that. And it just, it just made me take note. And from then, it's like, uh, can't stop seeing. So as far as artists seeing change over time, I, I think the biggest change I've seen 
if I may add, and I want to, I, I'm sure people would rather hear from you, but the biggest change that I've seen is that when I first started Creatively United in 2012, people thought I was nuts. Uh, it was like, well, what are you, are you trying to ruin your career? Like, what are you, what are you thinking of doing? Like, you're, you're going to take a, you're going to be, you're one of those tree huggers, like what the heck? And it was like, I just saw there was a need to stand up um, and showcase those people, in my opinion, who are doing the hero work in our community to save our forests, save our salmon, save our democracy, and bring all, and bring all those people together. So that's, that's how Creatively United came to be. And I feel like things are shifting and the change is that people are, fortunately, as we've seen in the video, we are a tribe awakening and we are starting to realize that there is something about living on this planet <laughs> that we need to start paying attention to. And it's not just about getting your latest package from Amazon. So Roberta, did you wanna add or, or David, anything to that? Just wanted to, you know, to um, say that there is that piece of forest that the family's trying to save. And that seemed like such an opportunity and for us. And yeah. And, and, and the, that for, yeah, the forest that we're talking about, the mountain road forest in Saanich, it's, um, yes, it has been in one family for many, many, many years. And they really want to see mountain road forest, um, which is between Prospect Lake. It's, it's a, it's a corridor between Prospect Lake and, and sort of elk beaver and um, they've been trying to save this as long as they can but they've been having to pay taxes full taxes on it without a break for many 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 years and it's now gotten to the point where I, I they, they they're letting it go for a price that is just a bargain to try to make sure it gets saved as a park so very generous of them right yeah, so, um, okay, where are we at? Oh, it's 12, and um, thank you. Um, David, were you gonna jump in or Roberta, or shall I just finish up with the last thing I was gonna show everyone? No, you go ahead. Thanks for, for uh, including me in this. It was really great. Well, Roy. thank you, Roy. Thank you, Pix. Thank you, David. And I just want, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And before we go, I'd like to leave everyone with this short clip from our very first live Creatively United for the Planet Earth Day Festival in honor of artists as change makers. For the love of our home, we are taking a stand. Voices and Thanks everybody for tuning in. We hope to see you February 24th. Thanks, Roberta. Thank you, David. Thank you, Roy. All right, stay well, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you again. <laughs>